a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a run. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding reality. To expanding reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas, on this incredibly cool episode, guys. Filmmaker and adventurer Alexander Petikoff comes by to talk about his search for Sasquatch cryptids and the unknown in general. This dude is awesome. You guys are absolutely going to love this. All the ways to find him located down in the show notes. One quick mention of the new t shirts that we have, those are also linked down below. Also, I made a fun little commercial for it that is going to be at the very end of this show. So the video version will be up on the video places it goes to. Audio version, the same thing. Make sure that you guys stick around and check that out. But without any further ado, let's get to this incredibly cool conversation with Alexander Petikoff. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It's perfect. And we are here and we are hanging out. Alexander Petikoff, dude, you are awesome. I mean, absolutely awesome. Uh, you got hooked up with me through a friend of ours, a mutual friend named Ben Tejada Ingram. Now, he was episode 131 back in the catalog there, so you guys can check that thing out. But dude, Alexander, it's fascinating to meet you. I've gone over your work, your filmmaker, adventurer, searching for Sasquatch, uh, cryptids and the unknown. And you and I had already had a conversation to set this up. And one of the things I noticed that just really struck me about you was not only who you are, you're just awesome. Also, your production work, the, the work you take and the pride you take in putting into telling your story and talking about these amazing topics. But another thing that I found fascinating when we spoke was about the reverence you have for the psychology behind this. And so I kind of dubbed this like the Sasquatchology that you have. And it's just fascinating, dude. So again, man, welcome. I'm grateful to, that you're spending some time with us here. And uh, if you don't mind, if I missed anything there, introduce yourself for our audience, if you don't mind, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. Awesome to be with you today. Uh, so yeah, my name is Alex Petikov. I'm I guess, as you mentioned, a filmmaker and adventurer, I'm kind of call myself a cryptid researcher. Uh, so I look into you know, this, this subject of cryptozoology, whether they be the individual animals or the people behind it. Oftentimes you find with these topics, people make more interesting stories than the creatures at times. You've got all these colorful characters that are involved in the search for mysterious beings around the world. So that's something I'm big into, big into the outdoors, uh, spent a lot of time backpacking and hiking and uh, doing stuff in the wilderness so i kind of say i like to combine my love of filmmaking with my love of the outdoors and looking for mysteries i think they kind of are a pretty good sort of trinity there in terms of um just stuff that i'm into so I'm, I'm lucky enough to be in a position now where i can do that and really have had the chance to go to so many beautiful places around the world and north america especially and uh, people would probably be most familiar with me from my bigfoot beyond the trail documentary series on the small town monsters youtube channel but i've delved into other cryptid topics and other things as well but that's just sort of my spiel i guess awesome well it's badass and like i said all the ways to find you will be linked below your website uh your link tree is great too link trees are cool uh i don't know everybody's been using one i don't know why it took me so long but i'm gonna get one of those set up i uh, gonna get your website and all that stuff linked over there but yeah your small town monsters your bigfoot beyond the trail youtube series super cool man like and we haven't done a specific big to bigfoot show yet so you were actually our first bigfoot conversation so welcome uh okay Honored. so thanks Absolutely, dude. Uh, I am curious, though, before we launch into that, what is one of the most random, you think, untalked about cryptids that you've discovered that you think that you're very excited to sort of put more light on? Oh. <laughs> Could you hear about, uh, like, the Mothman, Dogman, sure, you know, the Chupacabras? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, there's some that I don't know if I, I – I don't like to talk about them as much because I don't want someone to steal the idea, right? But I do really think – uh, you know, by way of how we met Ben Tejada Ingram's work on the little Nessie. I never heard of that case before. And I've, I've been really into 
dinosaur-like cryptids, aquatic cryptids. I'd never heard of that. And I mean, when I when he first reached out to me, how I met Ben was he kind of reached out to me and he said he was a fan of some of the work I'd done and asked me to write forward for his book, for an upcoming book, which I absolutely, once I kind of did some digging on him and, and I actually saw your episode with him, that's how I kind of learned a little bit about the story. And then I had him send me over the book. I was kind of hooked and I started going down a deep dive Google Earth, Venezuela, and looking at all these different places. And the little Nessie I thought was a really cool one. I think a lot of people in the cryptozoology world or in general fans of cryptids know about what's called Mokeleum bembe, which is a sort of dinosaur-like creature said to live in the Congo in Central Africa and in the vast jungles there. But nobody's really heard of this little Nessie story. So I thought that was really neat. Uh, that's one that I would absolutely love to shed light on. Yeah, well, um, I, I'll hook you up with uh, Jose Miguel Perez Gomez. He's the explorer that goes down there. I've had him on too, man. Oh, yes, cool. I watched your your show recently with him, and uh, and I obviously knew of him um, through Ben's book. And I, it was just such a fascinating story. I mean, when you combine that with that sort of uh, where the Lost World, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and all that stuff came from, was that very area. And they have this story of this little messy. I was kind of hooked to that story. I think that's a really neat one. Another one. I think a lot of people, um, this is, it's is more of a Bigfoot like creature, but a lot of people haven't heard of this is what's called the Otang, which is something described in South Africa as this hairy humanoid kind of creature, similar to, I guess, Bigfoot in parts of North America, a little bit smaller in stature. Uh, and how I learned about that was through a, a gentleman named Gareth Patterson, who lives in South Africa, who was formerly uh, rescuing lions in different parts of Africa and then tracked a secret herd of elephants that lived in the Nizna rainforest in Southern South Africa, which people thought were extinct. And apparently they were still there and he was able to track and document them. And we're talking about elephants. I mean, it's not like they're small creatures that can hide easily yet. They were presumed to be extinct. And he was able to document that they were real along the way had run-ins with this hairy man like creature and started hearing stories from locals about this thing that they called the Otang. And I've actually had independently of, of him, I had him on my, a show I used to run about a year ago, November of 2021. And after I had that show, I had multiple people independently contacted me with their South African Bigfoot like stories. So that's something I think nobody really is aware of. There's not a lot known about that. South Africa is kind of considered the cradle of human civilization, at least with some of the ancient humanoid species that lived in that area. So that's another interesting angle. That's one I think is is very fascinating because you don't hear a lot of these Bigfoot-like stories out of Africa. Of course, chimps, gorillas, lots of baboons. There's tons of different primates in in, in Africa that people are aware of, but not mystery hominid as much as uh, you know, Bigfoot and the Yeti are kind of famous in that realm. So that's another one I think would be pretty interesting. It seems that there are mysterious hominids on now what? Every continent, right? Just about. I mean... Aside from Antarctica, as far as we know, but Antarctica is yeah. a weird place. Yeah. <laughs> so who knows? Um, there are in Australia, there are stories of the Yowie. Uh, Europe, a little bit less. I mean, maybe parts of Russia. I think most European sort of wild man stories aren't contemporary. So they're Middle Ages, uh, folklore kind of stories. A lot of those areas, you have to remember, are not really as wild as they once were. I mean, right, parts right. of Russia and Siberia obviously still have vast amounts of wilderness, which would make sense for something to be able to to still be there. Uh, but basically every continent, I mean, South America has some stories. I'm not too familiar with them, but there's the stories of the Mapinguari, which some people say is like a Bigfoot-like creature, but I've also heard descriptions of it resembling a giant sloth, a ground sloth. So some people have theorized that maybe that animal might have exist, still exist in kind of the Amazon, and it's just one of these species that was presumed to be extinct, but is still around. Um, but yeah, just about every continent has some sort of stories. And throughout history, if you look at examples of different cultures, like I mentioned in the Middle Ages in Europe, you had the stories of the wood woes or the wild men. And I mean, there's artwork of knights battling tall, hairy man like creatures. And then, of course, you go to other cultures around the world. Same thing in Asia, uh, in Hinduism, there's depictions of the Himalayas with man like monkey creatures standing in the peaks and uh, China, the Yeren, a very interesting kind of story that goes back quite a while. Chinese dynasties have stories of running across hairy wild people in the woods. Russia, of course, as I mentioned, the Almas, the Almastis, the Caucasus region. And then, of course, North America probably has most most prolifically 
And I would say for a good reason, just the amount of history and folklore that the, the Native Americans and the First Nations peoples have on this continent. Very, very fascinating. I mean, up and down the coastal areas of the Pacific Northwest to other tribes across the continent. There are stories. Not all of them are the same. Some discuss a cannibal giant. Some call it a protector of the woods. Some say it's a uh, some sort of a demon. There's It's kind of runs the gamut in terms of descriptions of what these things are like. And I, I mean, I interpret that as just being humans trying to interpret what they're seeing. I mean, a lot of these cultures around the world gave mystical powers to things like bears and eagles and other animals that just sort of walk the earth. Whereas when it comes to things like a Sasquatch, I mean, you could have any interpretation you really want. For example, in Alaska, you know, they talk about uh, women and children being lured into the woods by baby crying sounds. And that's what draws, uh, you know, people in. And that's sort of described as something that these Sasquatch-like creatures do, whereas other areas, they see them as a, a, a lost tribe that just happens to live in the woods. They live a different lifestyle than the natives would have. You know, they don't do hunter gatherer activities. They don't, they just, they don't use fire. They're very primitive. So it's really interesting. I think something I'd heard from a uh, primatologist from Oxford University called Anna Nakaris. I listened to a presentation of hers a number of years ago, and she described studying these small uh, little creatures called slow lorises. I think they're somewhere on the primate family, but they're basically these little nocturnal kind of primate like creatures with these big eyes. And so they live in parts of Indonesia and she had, she had studied them for a while. And what she noticed was the different people groups in the areas, you know, different villages had different interpretations of essentially the same creature. For example, one village would say, if you saw one, it was really good luck. You know, you're going to have a great fortune or something tribe over. If you saw one, you should kill it right away because it's a curse. And then the other tribe said it was a demon if you saw it. So there was, but it was virtually the same exact animal. It was just different interpretations based on different people groups. So that happens, I mean, the world over, the way we try to interpret what we're seeing and things we don't understand. We just sort of conflate it that way. So something like Bigfoot, we still don't understand what it is, but we have all these different cultures and different people trying to explain maybe what it is. And that kind of leads us to where we are today in terms of trying to figure out what it is. I mean, there's now more than ever probably difference of opinion. Some people think it's a flesh and blood undiscovered animal. Others think it's some sort of a transitional multidimensional creature that can come and go as it pleases. So there's, there's probably more debate than there has ever been about what Sasquatch is or isn't. This is the part in the uh, conversation where the audience is now understanding why I said psych. Psych squatchology. This is the thing, man. You you get into the psychology of this, and it is so fascinating the way that you're you've got a, a great grips on the understanding of interpretation of this stuff, which is fascinating. You're not uh, pigeonholed into one thing. Awesome. You're also very open to the idea of interpretation, but also you get it, like in um, like you empathize, you know, with how people could view these things in certain lights, and especially based on, like you said, oral traditions. If these things are just living off by themselves somewhere. And all of a sudden, somebody comes across one, let's say gets scared and poops himself, okay? Goes back to the village, and now it's a horrible, evil thing. But really, it was right. just this thing getting scared. You know, it wasn't a big deal. No harm was done. Those animals, like most wildlife, are just as eager to get away from you as you are from it. So it's this interesting psychology that you put on this that is, again, why I'm so grateful that we're speaking here. Now, to something that you said, uh, you brought up giants, which I'm very grateful that you did because that's a question I had for you. Now, do you think that there could be some sort of misinterpretation or some sort of conflation between the stories that we hear of ancient giants, sort of uh, like in the Bible, the Nephilim, uh, Native American lore all over the place, global giant systems all over, uh, and the Bigfoot? Do you think that one has to do with one another, that they could be confused, or do you find them to be two totally separate entities? It's a good question. I mean, it's one that I haven't thought about a whole lot, but I definitely do think there probably is some sort of uh, conflation going on in certain certain places. I mean, certainly some of these giant stories wouldn't fit the bill of a modern sort of Bigfoot where you're talking about, you know, whether we're talking biblical stories, you know, David and Goliath, where it's, you know, uh, it's, he's using armor and weapons and that sort of thing. Very different than a hairy creature that doesn't even use fire. Uh, living in wilderness areas. So I would say, I mean, I would differentiate. I think we as human cultures, we have we have so many stories around the world of not only giants, but little people. 
you know, whether now people call them the Fae or whatever, gremlins. I mean, there's so many stories of small people, just as there are big people. Does that mean there were big and small people? I mean, we know for a fact there are groups in Africa where you have pygmies. I mean, the pygmy tribes, they're very short in stature, and they live on the same continent as the Maasai warriors in Kenya, who are extremely tall people. Um, you know, I'm not saying they're giants, but in terms of genetic diversity within humanity, I mean, we know that there were near sort of uh, human-like species, like in Indonesia on the island of Flores with the Homo floresiensis, where they're basically described as these small creatures nicknamed the Hobbit. And that happens to be in the same general part of the world as where modern stories of the Orang Pendek, a small hairy-like creature, like a Bigfoot, but three feet tall, are described to this day with credible reports. I mean, could you make the leap that that animal might still be alive and is an example of one of these things? Possibly. But I know there's a lot of kind of more conspiracies about the giant stuff. I haven't looked a whole lot into it. I know there's a lot of stories. I think, like I said, certainly in some places, maybe parts of medieval Europe, in some of these deep, dark corners of these forests where things were not, uh, you know, as discovered or, or traversed. Uh, for example, the stories of trolls and ogres. I kind of have a theory that, and I mean, it's not my theory per se, but it's something I find would make a lot of sense that a lot of these troll and ogre stories might come from populations of Neanderthals that managed to live off into much more recent history than when they supposedly died off. So could be knights or, or Vikings going through some of these remote areas of Scandinavia and they come across a tribe of Neanderthals who would have been larger and swarthier looking and oh that mountain is protected by trolls kind of makes sense why that would sort of happen so perhaps that does lend some uh, credence to some of our folklore about you know giants and larger than stature sort of uh, creatures but I think I, I wouldn't be able to say if if the Bigfoot and that sort of thing would be, would cover all those stories because as we talked about as I mentioned, there are the more kind of human-like giants, where it seems like they're basically just functioning in human-like societies with cultures and tools and clothing, and that's something else that I, I couldn't really speak to. Um, I just know the more the more wild ones, I could totally see how we as humans. I mean, for example, the Gigantopithecus, which was described as the largest ape in human history, which now they believe is related to the orangutan, but. Um, interesting how it was discovered with uh, teeth. The only evidence that the largest ape in history ever existed, this is a true story, are teeth and parts of a jawbone. We have nothing else to prove this thing was real. What if it was just a really big one of the small ones? I, I mean, apparently uh, paleontologists have been able to identify that through thousands of examples, but the, the interesting way is how they found these, and this was actually in the 1930s and 40s, kind of pre-World War II around that time, uh, in China, they would ex excavate some of these caves and bring out all these fossils. And there were actually quite a few discoveries of ancient species in Chinese apothecary shops because they would, these were dragon bones to the Chinese. They would grind them up and use them in their traditional medicine. So paleontologists had the idea to start buying bones from some of these Chinese shops. And they apparently were able to find enough examples of these, these teeth from Gigantopithecus. And What's believed is that it was a very specific circumstance. Porcupines around the world are known to eat bone. I mean, there's calcium there. It's just something they do. They help break down. I mean, when an animal dies in the woods, whether it be naturally or not, its body will break apart. Essentially, you've got all the scavengers and things that will come and get it. Porcupines oftentimes will drag bones into their uh, into their caves or their little lairs and just kind of eat them in there. And specifically with the Gigantopithecus, Apparently, there were bones of these creatures drug in by porcupines in China that happened to be in those caves. The rest of the, the bones would be eaten, but the, the teeth would be left by the porcupines. And, and because they were in those specific caves, it allowed preservation of that, whereas if it was just in the woods, it probably would have come apart. And I, I, I cite that example because people always ask me, well, why is there no Bigfoot body? Why have we not found anything? And I would say, well, supposedly we're supposed to believe that the largest ape in history, the only evidence we have it existed are teeth and part of a jawbone. So, I mean, how could you expect to find something like a Sasquatch in the North American soil, which is very acidic in the forest and the mountains where sightings are reported? I mean, we're not having Bigfoot sightings really going on in uh Dinosaur Valley in Utah, where they have all these fossils and things going on. It's not a suitable habitat for something like that. So um, I know that was kind of a tangent, but that just kind of illustrates my example. But the, the Gigantopithecus is believed to have also lived side by side by 
humans at the time. So you can only imagine people coming across this massive, you know, King Kong sized creature essentially, uh, and how terrifying that would have been. I mean, so you have examples throughout history that we believe that our ancestors interacted with larger than life creatures or near human sort of creatures. Again, could that explain all the giant stories? Probably not, but some of them for sure. There are two hilarious stories about paleontologists that I cite constantly because I just find them fun, okay? And it's not to knock every paleontologist. I'm sure there are great people out there doing great work. I kind of look at paleontology like a NASA employee. It's like there's a bigger thing going on that they're not privy to, but they work on things as if it's what their bosses are saying that it is. Now, I think that it's very interesting that uh, that – there was a list of thousands of dinosaurs that got cropped in third because what they realized is that they were misidentifying juveniles and identifying them as other species of one right. species of dinosaur. Now, you take two-thirds of the dinosaurs out of the population due to this error. That's funny. That's funny, right? Then you have the rotator cuff on the T-Rex. For a long time, they've been putting it on backwards, and they've all known it because of the way rotator cuffs function. The arms are supposed to go the other way like an ostrich. If you look at an ostrich skeleton, it's identical to a T-Rex. Right. It's just funny, right? And so then we have these teeth. Now, here's a question that I've not gotten to ask somebody because, again, this is our first Bigfoot conversation. Do you think that giant skeletons that have been found are Bigfoot remnants? Possibly if there have been any that have been found. I don't know. I know a lot of people like to talk about, you know, the Smithsonian and that sort of thing. That's oh, yeah. kind of a big thing. And I've never seen anything uh, personally that's convinced me. Not that I've really looked for that sort of thing. I'm more, at this point, interested in contemporary things. I, I, I you know, out in the field, really trying to find evidence for myself and and bring that to people. Um, obviously, you have to know about kind of the history, as, as we've talked about and kind of understand why people are interpreting things. And like you mentioned with the paleontologists, I mean, it's all about our interpretations. You look at dinosaur uh, statues or, or sketches from you know, the early 20th century, how hilarious they look compared to the 90s when Jurassic Park was a big thing and how now people are pushing back on that. So they're usually, they're always wrong about this stuff and there's reinterpretations. That happens a lot with the, you know, the human family kind of branch that we're a part of. 20 years ago, if you were saying that there were hobbit-sized people that lived in parts of Indonesia, you'd probably be laughed out of a classroom if you had said that. But that is now something that they've admitted to. So, I mean, it seems like people have a hard time admitting they're wrong, but, oh, we just misinterpreted it, right? Um, but things are, our understanding of things are always seemingly changing because we're finding new things that kind of push the boundaries of what we really think we know. I think there's an arrogance to assume that we know everything. And I think that when it comes to the Bigfoot topic is a big one because we've assumed that we've documented everything. We know what's out there. And, and every year there are new species discovered. They're usually small insects and, and rodents and bugs and that sort of thing and reptiles. But I mean, I have personally witnessed so much wild space still in existence in North America alone that it's actually ridiculous how much space there is out there, how lots of things could hide out there completely undetected. If it was strictly, you know, a flesh and blood kind of scenario. I mean, Canada, Alaska, it's just, and nowadays, especially people are clustering into urban areas, suburban areas. We don't live close to the land as our ancestors did even 100, 200 years ago, where more people on average lived a more agrarian lifestyle, a more down to earth lifestyle, whereas now uh, it's like a minority of people live that way or live even in rural areas, everyone's kind of bunching up. And whether that's by design or not is, a, is an interesting conversation, of course. But uh, we, we don't have those instincts that we did, especially uh, when it comes to the woods. So for something to be able to, to stay elusive, I think, is probably a good time uh, at this point. As you know, as has been happening, apparently, if these things are able to stay away from us the way they, they have been and elude us. But uh, you know, technology is getting better, but there's really not a lot of people actively looking. Not a lot of people take the topic seriously. Sasquatch, Bigfoot, it's mostly a punchline or it's a joke or, oh, I saw a Jack Link's beef jerky commercial. It's kind of the extent of it. Or people still think, oh, there's only one. You know, it's like Santa Claus or Easter Bunny. There's only one as opposed <laughs> to the idea that there's actually uh, a species yeah. of some kind, you know. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Like it's it's just one of those topics you can. There's so many different rabbit holes you can jump into when it comes to 
uh, Sasquatch. But I don't even know if I answered your original question. I apologize. No, <laughs> I no apologies needed, man. It's, it's the psych squatchology that I really, really dig here because I love talking to folks like you because you don't have a finite answer on this, but you are very open to the interpretations. You find value in the journey, and that's awesome. You haven't found anything, even as far as a piece of evidence, even with your own that says, this is where I'm staying and I'm holding on to this forever. Right. You say, hey, this is still, even though this I've found is subject to change and interpretation. That's what we need doing what you're doing. So thank you. Uh, and Sack Sax Squatch. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah, it's a, it's like a, he plays the the saxophone. Yeah. He's got a big Bigfoot suit on. Yeah. Yeah, he I've seen that. That's fun. a little thing. He stands in the woods and plays saxophone. He's got a keyboard there. I love it. He plays that one more time or whatever that, I don't know. Anyway. It's uh, a good vibe. Yeah, I've had people send me that. It's always a, a funny one to see. I'm, There's I'm also sure. one, it's like a, a She Squatch or something like that. And it's, it's like a Bigfoot suit and... She's got like uh, ponytails on and does like all these dances and it's like a tick, you know, basically a TikTok dancer, but in a Bigfoot form. So. We should link the two together. This is like a yeah, couple that, that needs, good, yeah. I mean, how adorable. And then the future <laughs> videos will have, couple. yes, and then the future videos will have their little Squatch squad, you know, the little <laughs> babies that they make and they make little costumes for. Okay. So uh, I'm very interested in some of the footage that you said that you've brought along. So do you want to share that with some of us? Again, guys, all the ways to find him linked down in the show notes. Go check out his YouTube for sure. Absolutely fascinating. And your website will be linked as well. So if you have it, man, you have the ability to share. So blow our fucking minds, dude. Go for it. Yeah, sure. So um, I'll just say a little bit about uh, Bigfoot Beyond the Trail before I, I lead into some of these clips just to kind of explain the context. But uh, so Bigfoot Beyond the Trail is a series that uh, I've been doing now for almost two years, uh, just about two years, actually, since I filmed the first one. Uh, and it was essentially the idea was my friend Seth and I, Seth Breedlow of the Small Town Monsters, I've been working on and off with them for a while. And we were just kind of thinking about, you know, let's do some kind of series where it's just kind of investigating Bigfoot cases. I'd always wanted to do that. I had been looking into my own stuff anyway. In my state of New Hampshire, I've got 50 plus sightings that I had uh, you know, documented. People had reached out to me with their stories or had heard about and that sort of thing. And I'd always been influenced by Les Shroud's Survivor Man and kind of doing this DIY do-it-yourself filming in the woods and no TV camera crew kind of stuff. Because that's a big criticism of a lot of the mainstream network programs uh, where you know, they've got researchers out in the woods, but there's 10 people behind camera. I mean, you're not going to sneak up on a squirrel that way. Yeah. So just kind of doing investigations and just showing the absolute truth of what's going on. There's enough uh, BS and fakery in the mainstream media and, and with corporate television in terms of this topic, it's gotten a really bad rep in, in, the, in the past few years. There's just a, they don't have an incentive to tell the truth on a lot of these networks. And that's a conversation for a different time. But uh, we started doing this Bigfoot Beyond the Trail series, and essentially it's just myself and sometimes crew members and other researchers I'll team up with across the United States. And we go out to some of these locations and try to investigate and do our best. We'll interview people. And uh, like I said, we tell the truth. It's This is what happens if we experience something weird. We'll tell you. If not, we're not going to add in creepy noises and ooh, yeah. you know, yeah. make it seem like it's something that it's not. I mean, this is really what's going on out there. And it's been a breath of fresh air, I think, for myself to see that kind of thing. And that's what I would like to see as an enthusiast. But so I'll play a few clips from just some of our some of our adventures. And we've got oh, at this point 24, 25 different documentaries. So we've been to, I mean, I can't even count how many locations on one hand. Next just time you come all, out to Texas over. or if you get one, you you know, that you need an extra hand on, let me know. I'd love to come join you for one of these things. I'm a super yeah, outdoors, outdoorsy person anyway. So, yeah. There's a I'd bunch of uh, Texas ones we, we we hope to do at some point. Dude, um, I'm there. I'm absolutely but, uh, there. Yeah. We'll talk about it further. But I had a quick question for you before you share sure. this. Uh, and, okay, so you mentioned studying cases, which I love this. What it immediately uh, what immediately I thought of was this UFO cases and investigations. Is there something equivalent to MUFON for Bigfoot? Yeah, there is. So there's uh, what's called probably the the big, the, I would say is the most equivalent to MUFON would be the BFRO. So that's the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. A lot of people have a lot of controversial opinions about them. Some people don't like them. Um, but I know plenty of people that are BFR investigators. They've been around since the 1990s. They have one of the largest public databases of sightings. Uh, founded by Matt Moneymaker of uh, finding the show Finding Bigfoot. He was on that show, but he had had the BFRO going for a number of years before that, like I said, since the 1990s. And they were really the first organization that had members that were from various 
backgrounds, whether it be law enforcement, scientists, just normal people, civilians, all kinds of stuff, people that just had an interest in the subjects. And they've got hundreds of investigators across the country. And I know individual investigators, they're great folks. I've got friends that are in the organization. Um, and they're basically, like I would say, the best equivalent to MUFON. Um, there are other groups as well. Uh, and there's a lot of other groups that I like too, that kind of focus on specific areas, but the BFRO has a different model. Uh, whereas, you know, they were really kind of the first ones to do that sort of thing and collect reports on that sort of a scale. And they have, you know, basically what will happen is, for example, somebody in Oregon has a Bigfoot sighting and they don't know who to turn to. They maybe they report it online in the BFRO database and then a local researcher can access that report behind the scenes, can reach out to the person, do a follow up investigation. Oh, the person was just pulling my leg. It's a fake. You know, they won't gotcha. publish that. But if they believe it was interesting enough they could follow up maybe even go to the location and then they will publish a report with the original sighting or encounter and then with the thoughts afterwards from their their conclusion of you know well the person was very credible when i talked to them and they can include that in their notes so i mean it's pretty detailed it's a good concept i i like the concept um like i said a lot of people nowadays don't like to be a far for other reasons i mean there's just a lot of chaos within what's called the bigfoot community a lot of different yeah. That happened. A lot of different factions and people that very opinionated. And Matt Moneymaker was on the show Finding Bigfoot, and a lot of people didn't like that. So, um, and that's not a knock on either Matt or the show or anyone else. It's just people have different opinions. Um, like I said, I think their model is great, and uh, that's that's the best equivalent to MUFON for sure. Cool. Perfectly answered, and thank you so much. Guys, uh, in the link description below is the video version of this, so make sure that you'll check that out so that you can take advantage of the clips that he's showing us. Dude, take it away, dude. This is awesome. All right. So I'm going to show you actually first. And uh, it's not an old, I wouldn't say it's an older clip, but uh, it's from one of our earlier episodes. Uh, it's just a fun intro. I really like the way it came out. Cool. So I will just share my screen and, uh, and be quiet then. So yeah, that one is uh, is called Rocky Mountain Sasquatch. That was like the intro section, just kind of, I, I thought it had a cool Wild West kind of vibe to it, and it, it that does. was a fun investigation. It does. It looks so cool. I can't wait to join you for one of these, man. Just walking around out there is going to be awesome. But it, going out there with the intention of uh, investigating something mysterious, that's even cooler. That's so much fun. That puts like a such a more interesting spin on hiking, you know? Yeah, it's, it's like, a, and that's what a lot of people joke about Bigfooting or researching Sasquatch, it's hiking or camping with a purpose. Yeah. Cause I you're there, you're, you're looking into stuff and, and then I'll share another clip here as well, which is this one is from a series that just came out at the end of 2022, probably our biggest really ever. Uh, and that's probably the most interesting case I've personally worked on. It's called the Alaskan coastal Sasquatch. And it was about, um, this remote property on the Kenai peninsula in Alaska, where essentially we were invited out there. Uh, by the property owner and I've come to know him and and the story is extremely interesting and I'll just share a clip and then maybe a few after that and we can kind of discuss maybe that case a little bit more yeah, so I would love that yeah let me just make sure the volume isn't too loud here we go <laughs> There's another little teaser trailer for See, you, dude, you guys. See, dude, just badass production, man. I'm like, yeah, yeah, go for it. Roll it. Oh, I... Oh, I would, I would say you do badass production, man. It's very cool. Very cool.
Thank you. And then I'll just share a clip from here. So because, you know, uh, in our in our productions, we go into an area, we like to holistically show that area. So we're looking for other wildlife there. We're documenting things that are in the area. We're not just everything is a Bigfoot. We want to, Bigfoot's the last thing we want to assume is what's going on. We want to be able to say, okay, we just heard that weird noise. What other animal could that be? Can we do a process of elimination? And then say, once we're kind of stumped, we can put in a category, okay, this is kind of weird. But um, just being able to go to some of these places has been such a blessing. Some of these areas of these remote corners of our world where there's still incredible wildlife. And that's something we really like to uh, convey to folks. And, you know, that wonder, I, I get so many messages from people saying, you know, we live vicariously through you guys. We bring you along for the journey. A big goal of mine as well with this is not to just take the Sasquatch subject seriously, but get people inspired to go out and adventure on their own and get out in nature, especially nowadays with technology, you know, kind of sitting right on our shoulders all the time, inspire people to get out there and kind of give them some hope in a world maybe that is, is a little bleak at times. So this is a, this is a clip I'm going to share uh, just under two minutes long, but it is a uh, sequence of some wildlife footage. So this is the kind of thing you can expect as well. Uh, which, so you're not just going to see Bigfoot stuff. You might learn how to fillet a fish as well as see other wildlife within some of these films. Cause we're giving you the whole experience. We're out camping, hiking, backpacking. We're not just going to sugarcoat it. We'll show you what it's like being out in these environments. So, Very cool. uh, without further ado, let me just share that real quick. We've seen some humpback whales in the bay, so we've deployed out here to see if we can film any of them, see them. We can see them uh, spouting. there you have it this is so awesome it's gorgeous like just like what you just showed there to go investigate it's like a trip for a lot of people that's a destination man and your destination is going to investigate something cool and you might as well just see some awesome humpback whales while you're there that's amazing well, yeah see that's the thing i mean that was in alaska where we saw i mean so many of the wildlife that's out there whether it be uh you know, evidence of moose or tons of black bear or seeing these humpback whales. We saw the last, we were out there for nine days, this location. And to put it in perspective, it's an, it's over an hour boat ride from the nearest town just to get there. So you're in an extremely remote location. On our last day out, we saw orcas, a pod of orcas with a young one. And we got to watch them hunting and uh, doing their thing and flying over with the drone. And we see so many other critters along the way. And that for me is part of documenting the journey. I mean, uh, basically we were, we were, you know, up late that, the night before this whale footage, we're up late doing our big footing stuff and trying to hear if we hear any weird sounds. And then we're woken up at seven in the morning, six in the morning, and they're like, hey, whales, whales, let's go. And we had to, you know, basically jumped out, all hopped in the boat and then deployed the drone and started seeing them. And it's just a spontaneous thing that happened one morning while we were out there. And I mean, it's part of our journey. And as I mentioned earlier, part of what I love to do is bring people along for the journey. So it's it's not just you know, here's, we're looking for Bigfoot, but it's, it's kind of part of the overall story. And it just shows you the viability of an area. 
if you're able to document other wildlife that live in an area, so like in this case in Alaska, obviously in the ocean, you've got a lot of different species, but on land, I mean, there's, as I mentioned, mountain goats, moose, black bear, brown bear, lynx, all sorts of stuff. It's such a viable habitat. So uh, why couldn't something like a Sasquatch exist in these areas that seem to have a lot of other biological markers that would make sense? So yeah, that's just a couple of clips I wanted to share, kind of let people get an idea of what uh, what what we kind of do. It's amazing. Again, guys, linked in the show notes, you want to see the full version of this as well as his series. So definitely go check that out. So tell us about the Alaskan coastal Sasquatch, man. This sounds awesome. Yeah, this was definitely by far our biggest kind of endeavor uh, and probably one of my personal favorites. So long story short, in May of 2021, I got an email from a gentleman who uh, was retired military, uh, had a very professional career, uh, lives up in Alaska, originally was from my neck of the woods in the New England area, um, which was kind of an interesting connection. But he told me he had this remote property that he had built in on the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska a number of years ago, you know, three, four years ago. And since they had built that cabin and literally from the moment they stepped on the land there to start building this cabin, they've experienced a lot of strange things. They've had, they've witnessed football sized rocks flying horizontally from the woods into the water, had rocks thrown in their direction, hearing what are described as wood knocks, which is often associated with Sasquatch, which is a kind of a, like a, if you took a baseball bat and hit it against a tree, uh, whistle noises, whoops with like a whoop, strange noises, uh, other unusual audio, just tons of weird things that initially I mean, for example, I'll tell you the story. When they first went out there, property owner had just bought this plot of land, completely remote area. I mean, it's very, it's actually kind of dangerous getting out there. I mean, if the seas aren't right, you'll have a tough time getting out there, but it's an extremely remote area. People in Alaska, they're different. They, they're, they're hardcore, you know? So they wanted to build this cabin as a fishing cabin, but they get out there the first time. And this location, as you might've seen some of that footage, it's it's surrounded by these massive mountains and it's a temperate rainforest environment actually in that area that leads all the way down to Northern California. So everything in between the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon, British Columbia, Southeast Alaska, it's that temperate rainforest kind of environment. And that's actually where a lot of Sasquatch lore and legend comes from the term sasquatch comes from british columbia uh, tons of sightings great habitat but they had made a landfall into this area and were just clearing trees to start having an area to build the foundations for the cabin and they had heard what they described as some kind of a roaring like noise from the other side of the bay and it was getting closer which is unusual animals don't usually do that and then uh, one of them actually witnessed a football sized rock fly horizontally from the tree line just into the water. I mean, what animals do that, right? That was their first kind of question. And uh, the property owner, Scott, he was, he's a big game hunter. I mean, he's, he's a, he's a tough dude. He gets out there. I mean, he's taken a Pleistocene era sized moose down. I mean, the guy knows his stuff for sure. So it was a very unusual, you know, why would something like this be going on? They heard whistles that day, other things, uh, they would sleep out of the boat at night. And as they cleared that land, they just had other weird things happening. But after that first trip, he's on his way out and he's talking to a guy that he's going to contract to bring lumber out there. So his boat wasn't big enough to be able to fit all the materials they needed. So he goes to another guy from this local community you know, over an hour away, this port town, and basically says, hey, you know, um, I'd like to contract you and whatever. And he's asking him, hey, we had a lot of this weird stuff happen out here. And he's like, oh, you mean like Bigfoot? It's like nonchalant and and Scott, the property owner, kind of was taken aback a little bit and thought maybe they were making fun of him. Like, you know, why would you why would you say that kind of thing? No, no, I'm serious. And he tells him how a few weeks before that he had actually this this captain of this boat that he was going to contract had actually taken some gentlemen out to this very plot of land who they were interested in buying it. You know, it was listed and there was obviously people interested to build kind of a remote Alaskan cabin. And these are some guys from Georgia. And they said they didn't want anything to do with it because they had said something was stomping around their camp all night and running around. And they, they had gone out of the tent and like something like a bulldozer went off through the woods and, you know, maybe a bear could do that. But they just were really creeped out. And uh, furthermore, this captain tells a story about uh, the show Survivor Man featuring Les Stroud. So he, when Les Stroud was filming his show Survivor Man, before he got into the Bigfoot stuff, because Les Stroud did a whole Survivor Man Bigfoot show, but Les Stroud, and I remember hearing about this encounter years ago. 
uh, on some radio show, he was asked, have you ever experienced Bigfoot? You're in a, a lot of these remote areas. And they thought it was going to be a joke. And Les Stroud answers, well, actually, you know, I've had this and this happen. So back to the captain, he was contracted by Les Stroud's production company to take Les and his crew out there. And essentially they drop Les off in the water and they film him going and he leaves and he does his solo thing. He doesn't take a crew with him or anything. Well, he said when they picked him up a number of days later, he kind of looked sort of on edge. He looked kind of rough. He hadn't slept a lot. And he, and he immediately started talking about what are the possibilities that something like Sasquatch is real. And he described basically hearing you know, something making oh, oh, oh noises and crashing through the trees around him and very weird kind of encounter. And that's, that's a story that Les would talk about. So Scott, the property owner, heard this story and thought that was interesting. And that turns out that's the same general region of the Kenai Peninsula where Les had this encounter where Scott then built this cabin. But as they built the cabin, they had a lot of strange things going on. Uh, things would go missing. I think there's one story of a, a hatchet that just went missing. They bought a new one. You know, just thought, oh, somebody misplaced it. It fell in a crack or something, whatever. It's not a big deal. They bought a new one. Well, the next season, they get back to the location. That very hatchet that went missing is just leaned up against the side of the cabin. Like, come on. You would have seen that if it was there. Yeah. Uh, rocks placed on uh, an old rusty bench there. And then one of the interesting ones, and this is something for the visual folks, would be these these guys here, the netted rocks. So you can see that. This is one that I picked up on location there. There's thousands of these littering the coast of Alaska. These were used by fishermen back in the day. It's basically a rock covered in just a plastic net, cheaper than using lead or metal to weigh down your fishing nets. Plenty of rocks, right? Free resource. They would grab them, put them together, and use them on their boats for fishing. And now they're littered all across the shores of remote Alaska because that's where a lot of these guys would go in and fish. And there were there were communities there at some point as well that – uh, have since been extinguished, extinguished, but they would find these guys, they would, what they would do is they would moor their boat out in the bay because they didn't want to sleep on the land for fear of brown bears, very serious, you know, brown bears and grizzly bears, that kind of thing. And they would, they would moor and stay out in the boat at night and then go to land in the day on a Zodiac and log and continue clearing land. But there was a number of occasions where they would kind of find these inside their boat as they were leaving or they would hear what sounds like a door slamming while they're out on the working and land and then later on they'd find these kind of inside the boat a, a, it, implying that they were that something had thrown one of these over 100 feet from shoreline into a boat Damn. And, and this is just one that i picked up because i really you know they're just everywhere you know i i it's kind of a souvenir but um, so that's kind of intriguing. And you got uh, some and, litter off the ground. So thank you. I consider well, yeah. picking up litter, but that's also a souvenir. Oh, yeah, I absolutely. love how double Dutch you are with everything. You're like, yes, we're going to research <laughs> Bigfoot, but we're also going to do some dope wildlife footage and some survival techniques. I'm also going to pick up some litter. That's also a souvenir with this incredible story. Yeah, very, I mean, and, and it's just part of that kind of Alaskan uh, you know, experience up in that area. But yeah, essentially they had so much going on. I mean, more than I can talk about here, um, but uh they then had contacted some researchers. Uh, Scott had been kind of pretty, still pretty skeptical. He says, I don't know what these things are. You know, I've never seen one, but we've had, they brought so many people out there that have had weird experiences, uh, big game hunters from Alaska, biologists, people that are hardcore that have all had weird things happen. You know, they're just all hanging around the campfire and a rock comes whizzing over their head and lands kind of next to them. That, that sort of thing, like hard to explain. Uh, you know, being paralleled by something going to the outhouse, finding the toilet seat ripped off and thrown 20 feet in the woods, jars of peanut butter that are just moved, you know, no scratch marks, bite marks or anything. They would leave them out there with the idea that maybe something could open it and find stuff moved and lots of just so much more than I can even think of right now, just because there's so many stories. But one of the more intriguing ones was before they had completely finished the cabin, I believe it was the first season, the backside was their only entrance. So essentially the cabin now has a staircase to get up to it that can be lifted just in case for bears and that sort of thing. And then you have a nice little deck in the front where you can sit and you're kind of elevated. I mean, this is an area with some very dangerous critters, as I mentioned, but that first season prior to the completion, their only way in was kind of in the back. So what they would do is at night, they would seal that up with some plywood and put a big Yeti cooler that weighed almost 70 pounds, just leaned up against that back have it sit there, whatever. And one night, something apparently tried to get in and 
uh, smacked that plywood and it sent the Yeti cooler halfway across the cabin, smashing against the wall. And, you know, they're all thinking it's a bear coming in. So they're grabbing shotguns, whatever it's, uh, you know, it's dusk kind of conditions because Alaska, obviously, with the difference in sunlight, daylight, depends which time of year. But, you know, they, they're thinking it's a bear and they just hear what they can only describe as bipedal footsteps going up the hill. So, I mean, it's it could have been a bear, I suppose, possibly, but it was very weird. And uh, Scott and those guys, they kind of relayed that experience. But a lot of experiences and a lot of weird audio. And then Scott has started reaching out to Bigfoot researchers like David Ellis of the Olympic Project, who's somebody that I think is a very uh, knowledgeable person when it comes to alleged Sasquatch audio. Uh, the Olympic Project being a research group from Washington State. They focus on the Olympic Peninsula, a very fascinating and one of the one of the best Bigfoot research groups, in my opinion. Um, David Ellis had examined audio and essentially had said, hey, you should start leaving audio recorders out there. Try and capture some of the audio you've gotten out there. And they've captured a lot of really intriguing and strange stuff from that area. And I can actually play a little sequence with, in my opinion, some of the more intriguing audio from that. So I can just play that real quick. That's yeah, yeah, that'd just be under a minute. And uh, then, we can, then we can discuss that a little bit further. So Please. here we go. So there's some of that. <laughs> let me ask let me ask you something about the audio because I'm curious about this. There are birds in the Amazon rainforest that will take and mimic sounds that they hear from construction people, from car horns, from radios, from children laughing, and it sounds exactly like that. Do you think that Bigfoot is capable of some sort of mimicry like that? I mean, it's something that's been discussed. I've never personally experienced anything like that, um, but I've heard people talk about it before. Certain encounters, some of the more intriguing ones, were ones where people would say something in kind of tried to mimic calling dogs, for example. You know, somebody would be walking in the woods with their dog, maybe on their r remote property, and they would hear somebody calling their dogs from the woods, but it almost sounded like maybe somebody with a speech impediment or kind of sounding unusual and the dog would be very confused you know what's going on <laughs> what master what's going on you know that kind of thing so i've heard the story before um a lot i think a lot of times people say certain audio that that turns out to be a coyote well they'll say oh it's just a bigfoot mimicking a coyote or an owl which you know maybe a cop out in certain situations putting the kind of the skeptical cap on but i mean I wouldn't be surprised if something like this could chimps and gorillas. I mean, they can't mimic us per se, but uh, they can, you know, imitate certain behaviors that we do. You know, they can, they can act like it's, you know, people have a chimp do put on a suit, kind of do some funny stuff. It's like imi imitating a human. Uh, they clearly understand sort of what they're doing, right? They're kind of copying behavior that they're seeing. I don't see why another creature might not be able to do that. Um, yeah, and it's really to what you said about the um, baby crying in the woods thing, you know, because this uh, you you were talking about it in respects with Alaska, which absolutely, but also the Appalachian Mountains, man. Those have like some crazy stories about you don't go in the woods when you hear your name called or a baby crying or anything like that. And so then, you know, this then ties into Native American lore with the uh, skinwalker. So now you're talking about something that's capable of looking and appearing and sounding like something completely different, but it's due to a lure of you to it. So it wants you to go to it. Now, what's interesting about this is when you said lured into the woods, baby crying and things like that in that Alaska area, but we're also talking about Bigfoot. I, I may be presumptuous here by assuming that they're different things. You know, I kind of consider Bigfoot in the category. I, I look at it through multiple lenses. So like you could be a primate that's undiscovered because I mean, dude, absolutely. There's so much space and I do not disagree with you. I thought this actually when I went to Washington State, I went up there with a family trip for my brothers and dad and I a couple years ago. 
And uh, there is so much space up there driving around Mount Rainier and everything in the wilderness. I could see how something would hide up there. So uh, I guess the question, of course, about mimicry and that, I mean, yes, then we go real skeptical and woo-woo. If we're staying with that it's a primate that uh, perhaps just is undiscovered still or minimally discovered and doesn't want to be, then perhaps, yeah, that is something totally different. It's just very interesting, the vocalizations and how one could be lured like a siren or something. You know what I mean? So can I interject? Please, yeah, yeah. This may blow your mind a little bit here when it comes to the the baby crying audio. Let me just... I'll play this for a quick second, and then we will we will discuss this immediately afterwards. This is something I think you'll find interesting. It's only one whimmer out here. It's never we we haven't heard it. It's only one whimmer out here. It's. It's just a strange thing. That's interesting. (laughs) Only when women are out, as if to lure their maternal instinct. This, yeah, this is where it gets really weird. And and, I mean, this is something that I've talked about before, and I I still find it so fascinating. So that was one of the original clips that I'd been sent amongst the other ones, which kind of some of them sound primate-like. You've got the whales going on that actually sound very much like howler monkeys or gibbons, I've been told. Uh, but this baby crying audio was one of the creepiest ones I received. And I initially, my reaction was, okay, I, you know, this is really weird. I've got to try and match it to, let's say, baby porcupines crying or an otter or something, trying to find something that I could match it with. And I wasn't able to find a perfect match. If anyone can find it, please, I welcome that. But the weird thing is, and when we talk about coincidence, so on this property, you know, they've had so many of these things happen. And there's only been a few occasions when women have been brought out there, you know, whether it's Scott bringing his wife or uh, her bringing some friends. That's happened twice. And the two times that's happened has been when this baby crying audio has been heard or observed. So the first time it happened, you know, they thought it was weird. They made a journal entry of it. It was unusual. Heard what sounded like a baby crying coming from the woods. The second time this happened, this was the point when he was recording audio. And the story was that his wife and her friend were there and they were with, you know, they all kind of went on a trip. And they were berry picking in the woods. This was when berries were in season. And they both independently heard this baby crying sound. And they were kind of aware of it. And they told Scott, you know, they were like, oh, they didn't want to tell him at first because they thought, oh, it was a silly, you know, kind of thing. And then they finally sort of told each other, well, we both heard this independently of one another. They tell Scott, he said, well, if, if you heard it, I would have recorded it because I've got a recorder out. And that's the clip you hear there. So it was women in the woods. And that sound is coming from the woods. Now, you could say, yeah, there maybe there's an animal out there that cries like a baby. These guys have been going out there for a number of years, all during the summer seasons. You know, they don't, they can really can't get out there from October to to April. They're, it's just off limits because of the way the seas are very rough. So it's the summer season, Alaska. They're out there in the fall. Why have they never heard this sound at any other point? It's only happened when women were present on the property. That is very unusual. It gets even weirder because uh, per native stories in Southeast Alaska and other parts of Alaska, the Tlingit peoples and others have a story of something they call the Kushtaka, which from my understanding is kind of called the Otter Man. And uh, it's not because it's really described as being a giant man-sized otter, but it's a hairy thing that's seen, hairy man-like creatures seen swimming between channels and islands and that sort of thing which is interesting. We have Sasquatch sightings that are reported from parts of British Columbia, Southeast Alaska, of Sasquatches seen swimming between islands and channels, Vancouver Island. I mean, there's mountain lions, bears, elk, deer, all these animals can be observed. Moose can be seen swimming, even in salt water, from an island habitat to a bay. I mean, it wouldn't even be unusual in some of these larger channels to see maybe a mountain lion or a bear swim across these channels. Why wouldn't something like a Sasquatch possibly do the same? So you have these native stories of this otter man, but the weird thing about the otter man is that it's reported to create a baby crying sound with the intention of luring in women or children into the woods. That's weird. So while we were filming, so Scott has recorded this audio, right? And while we were filming this, this was in May of 2022 that we were up in Alaska. We spent, I said, like nine days at the cabin. While we were doing that, myself and my crew, 
Seth Breedlove and the rest of the Small Town Monsters crew were filming a documentary called On the On, on the Trail of Bigfoot, The Last Frontier. And that's a more, whereas we were kind of focusing on a specific case, that's a more widespread look at the Alaskan Bigfoot phenomena in a way it's never been covered before. So they interviewed like dozens of people, including a lot of Alaskan natives. And something that kept coming up with some of these natives and their stories, including an experience uh, somebody had relayed to them was about hearing this baby crying sound, actually seeing a Bigfoot like creature. And another guy talking about, yeah, this is part of the stories. If you hear the baby crying, you know, that's trying to lure women and children in and they don't know why that is, but it's just part of their folklore. And you have Scott who is not related to that culture in any way. He's just happens to have built a property out there experiencing this phenomena, which is something that the people that have inhabited that, that area for thousands of years talk about. I mean, that is like a pretty interesting coincidence if if I, if I say so. It's fascinating to me that this is the second account that I've heard of the phenomena treating men and women differently. What's interesting about this is whenever you uh, – I just got finished uh, reading Bud Hopkins' Missing Time book. Um, Robbie Graham, author of Silver Screen Saucers, uh, he has a publishing house called August Night Press, and he republished that and Intruders by – Bud Hopkins, and he sent me <clears throat> a couple of copies, so I went through it. So shout out Robbie is what I'm trying to say. Okay. One of the interesting things that's noted in there is the difference in uh, hypnotic regressions between men and women. And Bud points this out in the in the book. I'm grateful he did because of what you just talked about here. One of the examples is, is that when women are talking about uh, when they go back to the moment of which they were contacted allegedly and they relive that, it's not only a very comfortable experience, but it's very cordial. It seems very fun and familiar. They ask a ton of questions. They're very interactive. So they treat women differently. With men, it's usually, uh, in the Pascagoula case, of course, um, that those dudes were incapacitated like immediately. And if men and women are abducted together in the Betty and Barney Hill case, for instance, Betty was allegedly completely conscious when she was walking up a ramp on her own while her husband was incapacitated behind her and being led in unconscious. So it's this idea of incapacitating the threat is what it seems like. But also it seems like that the, the phenomena, whatever it is, Bigfoot or the contact phenomena, knows that women aren't as great of a physical threat. So what this tells me is, is that this is more of a physical entity because if they're different around men, which they would perceive as a physical threat, as we will in all species, then they would treat women differently as well. So this idea, again, that the phenomena, whatever it is, is now interfacing with two different incredibly cool phenomena with men and women in the same way. It's that they treat the men as a threat and the women as not. So then the question would be, of course, as a control, and I'm sure you've mentioned this, is to have his wife go out there with a couple of her friends alone and to see what that would be like. You know, I mean, maybe take some Mossad badass girls with you or something like that. But like you could go out there and do this as a control experiment to see if this continued. Because now what's in my mind is, is not only this, what we just talked about, but also the otter man and the fact that maybe this is now there's way more up there that's different but it's sort of you know because now it's like maybe the otter man is standing by a bigfoot when it makes that baby cry and then the bigfoot looks over like no no no, that wasn't me but nobody sees the otter man they just see the bigfoot and so now bigfoot's the one making the cry then you have the fact that there or perhaps the fact that there is some sort of other thing out there that is under the intent to lure something to it for whatever reason where we could say consumption right it probably just looks at it as meat and so you have that element of it, but Bigfoot seems to not want that at all. It just wants to be left alone. So it's just this interesting dichotomy between cryptids up there making all sorts of noises and different interpretations, like you said earlier, from different legends that can be interpreted differently. We don't know what their motives are, but it's very interesting. And the baby cry that you played, man, I'm glad that you brought it up. It sounds like something imitating a baby's cry. Yeah, and I mean, not it, in a it's... way that you'd run to it, in a way that it sounds like it's trying to be a baby but it's not doing a good job of it i it's, think it's creepy i mean it's one of the it's i've creepy. heard stories of the baby crying stuff from as you mentioned appalachia in particular other areas but i've never heard a recording i mean it's all it's just a story oh i heard this but this one was really interesting because it was a recording i mean i don't know it's just a very unusual one but it is interesting you mentioned the kind of dichotomy the, the treatment of men and women um, I mean, I think I personally lean more towards Sasquatch being some sort of physical creature. I, and I should say, I, we don't know what it is. I mean, I could be totally wrong, but in my opinion, even if it is something paranormal, it is still a physical component because there is still 
you can find tracks, rocks are being thrown, things are happening that it means there's a phys- some sort of physical interaction going on. So, you know, because there's a big debate between strictly flesh and blood as an undiscovered primate or some sort, and then the weirder element. I yeah. say, I mean, maybe there's a little bit of both. I don't know. I really don't. I, I Like I said, I lean more towards that flesh and blood side, but um, I'm not going to discount other experiences. And, you know, I've heard tons of Sasquatch encounters, a vast majority of them, Oh, I saw it cross the road or, oh, it was walking on the trail up there and it just crossed the path. There's nothing that unusual about that. Right. And there's a minority of reports where there is orbs or other weird stuff involved, which, you know, I kind of just keep it there. I don't know exactly. Uh, you know, I'm not going to cherry pick the data and just disregard that entirely. But um, I think especially regardless of the physical aspect of it, but, you know, talking about something like a Sasquatch, let's say it's MO out there is trying to stay hidden, but you've got people then coming in and setting up a perimeter and they're setting up a cabin, they're invading your home basically. So yeah. I think maybe that, that may be some of the aggressive behavior that, that is reported in places like this. But I mean, can you imagine, right? A group of men in the woods with these powerful weapons, usually guns versus females in the woods. I mean, there's a completely going to be a different, even just, um, you know, pheromones and that sort of things that are given off. Yes. What does four yes. dudes standing around with guns kind of seem like maybe a hunting party, right? Yep. Whereas you throw women in the mix, it's a little bit more mellow, perhaps it's a little uh, more not as aggressive. There's not that testosterone. I mean, that 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 element of it. So uh, that is something we absolutely when we were out there, unfortunately, it was only a, a, a group of us guys. But uh, we are hoping to return there because we have a lot. You know, this is our first attempt there. Uh, we really didn't know what to expect. We had a lot of strange things happen, stuff I can't explain. But um we spent those days out there and that's documented entirely in part one and part two of the Alaskan coastal Sasquatch. But we hope to go back out there and do experiments like that, you know, have just bring out some badass female researchers and have them just kind of go at it alone for a little bit, just do a control, just sort of see what happens, throw men in the mix. Does that change anything, if anything happens at all? But um, that's something that really hasn't been tried out much at this location. And you got to realize this place was built as somebody's, uh, weekend you know kind of getaway place it was a place to go fishing and do alaskan stuff you know the halibut runs salmon runs incredible seafood out there i mean that that was the intention they never thought they'd have all this weird stuff happening so um you know i'm just lucky enough to be in a position where we have kind of access to that location but you know these guys they go about their life they they experience weird stuff when they go out there but they, they they'll journal it they'll have the recorders out and uh, you know, that's just part of the experience, I guess, of going out there now. They're not really, that wasn't the goal when they started out with this cabin. So um, we we want to be able to try some new stuff and try some techniques out and see what happens and see if something responds. And I just, I found that parallel really interesting between what was going on out there and some of the stories of the natives regarding, you know, the hairy man, the the Kushtaka, the things that they're part of their culture that they sort of identify as these mystery hominids that live out in the woods. And, and that's kind of some of the stuff that's been experienced out there. Uh, it's, it's interesting. And it, it comes back again to that interpretation side of things, uh, the way those people interpreted these situations that maybe there was just one instance of uh, uh, and maybe something even just blamed on a Sasquatch. Maybe some woman from a village went out and she fell into a crevasse and was never seen again. And that then became blamed on the Sasquatch or there was, you only need one instance of a abduction to happen where that suddenly becomes the tribal boogeyman. And that may serve as a good purpose to keep your women and children from going out and getting mauled by a grizzly bear. Uh, it's, it serves as that purpose. But um, you know, I think if these things are, you know, just sort of living in their environment, I don't think, I think they probably realize that more humans is not a good thing. I mean, you start killing off people. What does that usually bring in that brings more humans in that's going to bring in search and rescue and coast guard and a lot more prying eyes so um i don't think sasquatch are really that aggressive in general i think it's more of a territorial thing uh, which makes sense i mean Mm -hmm. you know somebody's stepping on your turf that sort of thing but maybe in areas other parts of the u.s and canada where there's more of a human presence uh there's maybe behavioral adaptations where they learn how to kind of avoid and, and not do certain things whereas concept of sort of virgin Sasquatch where they would be out in more remote areas and they don't have 
as much exposure to people that maybe when people come in, there's their kind of a hostile reaction. That's something that's been theorized by folks like Cliff Berrickman in, in the past. And there seem to be some cases that sort of point to that. And it's all speculation at the end of the day. I mean, we can't really say with definitive facts what's going on, but I'm trying to kind of, you know, postulate something that in the way of a theory, in the sense that, okay, we have these reported behaviors. We can only maybe sort of predict what these things might do based off of other encounters and, and a consistency. Once you, know, you have an individual report, it might not be as, as useful, you know, okay, there was a Bigfoot scene crossing the road over there. But once you're able to say, okay, over the course of a decade, there's been 10 sightings in this area. What does that tell us? They return to the same areas. They do certain behaviors. So when you start mapping out some of that um, anecdotal data, which, you know, on its face is not as valuable, you know, like I said, but when you start grouping it together, you might start noticing patterns. I mean, we see a, a heck of a coincidence in a lot of places in the U.S. And full credit to my buddy Scott of the Bigfoot Mapping Project, who does some incredible work on uh, creating these maps with sightings and uh, matching them up with known wildlife corridors and green belts. And you, know, you see sightings that are almost sticking to those areas in certain parts of the country. Really intriguing. I mean, it means that not only do you have mountain lions or bears or other animals using these corridors, but you have you know, possible Sasquatch sightings that are seemingly lining up with those areas, you know, from one national forest to another area and, and space in between, that's where the sightings are happening on these fringes, which I find really intriguing. Um, obviously, in an area like this, Kenai Peninsula, Alaska, you wouldn't really need, I mean, this, it, we're, we're the outsider in that case, you know, whereas we're, uh, we're uh, you know, this cabin is an outpost of our civilization, whereas everything else is controlled by all the other critters out there. So, um, yeah, it's just interesting noticing those patterns and and thinking about that and and using that sort of anecdotal data as as best we can to try and either map stuff out or figure out patterns and that sort of thing. I will, you know, uh, encourage you to use the word speculative, but as long as you put insightful in front of that, whenever you talk about yourself, whenever you're doing stuff, because you have just such an insightful quality about approaching this topic and and anything about this, it's more of a wildlife research project for you, and so you take it very, very seriously. I think this is fascinating, as well as it's coupled in mystery. As far as the patterns go, I I'm grateful that you brought it up. Actually, a question I had for you. So as far as patterns go. Uh, trail and movement and things like that it's it's fascinating have there been any patterns or any kind of data collected on maybe like this time of year or a certain uh temperature or a certain altitude or a certain full moon or this happened in aquarius and they always happen in aquarius like that kind of stuff is there any kind of data that's been brought together like that there has been. There's actually a great account called Squatcher Metrics. Guy over in the UK does a phenomenal job of taking, you know, a, a group of sightings. Let's say you've got, I don't know, let's say Washington State. We've got 300 sightings from a certain area over the course of 20 years. Now let's see how many of those sightings take place in December. Mm. Okay, yeah. mark that down. 10. How many take place in July? 30. Okay, and they start noticing patterns certain times a year. It seems like in areas where there's more of a temperate kind of climate so and deciduous trees like along the eastern uh, coast of the United States. So the Appalachian Mountains, uh, in terms of where sightings happen, I should say, the bulk of them tend to take place in you know, mountainous regions, uh, swamps down south in Florida and places in the northwest. You, know, you don't have a lot of sightings in cornfields in Kansas and Iowa. You know, there's some places, but very rarely. They seem to greatly mirror uh, you know, habitat of other critters. And that's why some scientists as of recent have speculated, well, you know, black black bear sightings, we can use Bigfoot sightings to predict how many black bears in an area. Because people, when they see Bigfoot, they're just see miss seeing a black bear. You know, that's, that's the answer, right? Despite the fact that, well, what about places where black bears don't exist, like Australia, but there still are reports of Sasquatch-like creatures. But um, so Squatcher Metrics and others will take this data and kind of figure out which months might be more prevalent. Seems like in those areas in deciduous, uh, trees where like in the, where I live in New England and kind of further down south, there's a, there's a much more seasonal pattern than there would be in a place like Florida where it's green most, most of the year. Uh, so in the fall, there seems to be a lot of activity and that kind of makes sense because you've got animals getting ready for winter, a lot of scrambling around doing, uh, and then, uh, it just kind of I don't know, it makes sort of sense. Whereas in a place like the Rocky mountains, there seems to be uh, a sort of a pattern of maybe following elk herds. So elk in the winter time will move in lower elevations. They'll move up higher in the summer months because it's a little cooler up there. And 
the sightings in some ways seem to match that. Um, I don't have stats, like I said, off uh, of, of squatcher metrics or any of these guys off the top of my head, but um, those accounts do a great job and they'll say, okay, let's look at one region, you know, what prevalence of sightings happen in the winter versus the summer, and they can kind of determine from there. Uh, so there does seem to be a seasonal pattern, whereas in a place like Florida, it's kind of random. I mean, because you have suitable habitat for wildlife year round, sightings, you know, this could happen in December. I mean, I was just in Florida a couple weeks ago in January and we had one day where it was you know, almost 95 degrees with humidity. Another day, you know, it was it almost, it got in like the low forties at night. So it's just that, but it stays pretty nice year round. There's not like a huge fluctuation like there would be where I live in New Hampshire, where, you know, there's two feet of snow outside right now. And in July, this will be a perfect habitat for lots of stuff moving through. So there is a seasonal um, pattern in my view, and and you kind of notice some of those. And that only really comes when you have a, a, a number of credible sightings that you can pool together. But there's people that are way better at data than I am that do this stuff. So I would definitely point you to people like the Bigfoot Mapping Project and Squatcher Metrics because they do a phenomenal job with taking all that raw data and actually making it useful. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I have a question for you um, before I let you run here, just the last one here. And I'm just curious about these relationships that people say that they have with Bigfoot. I'm sure you've heard these stories, uh, exchanging gifts, uh, leaving a yeah. gift and then someone will, they'll come back and there's something obviously sort of like the acts that you talked about very deliberately left in the same location. So first right. question is, I'm sure you've heard of that. And I'm just curious what you think of it, but also have you met up with one of these people and just like hung out with them and gone on their daily Sasquatch Sasquatch swap with them and just like walk out there and like trade stuff and maybe leave little things to try and communicate? I don't know. I'm just curious what you think about that phenomena. Yeah. I mean, so a lot of people like to call it gifting and that sort of thing. Habituation is another one. And um, I think the idea is, let's say you, you were to model this off of primate research. So Diane Fossey or Jane Goodall studying chimps and gorillas in Africa. I mean, there were a number of weeks before they would actually even see a gorilla or a chimp, but they'd be aware of their presence. But these gorillas did not want to show themselves to this person they perceived as a threat. So there was a familiarity kind of made there. Uh, I don't know if they did exactly gifting, but it was more of just kind of like a, okay, we see you're not a threat sort of thing, a, a defense mechanism, which makes sense. Um, and the idea, I guess, behind gifting with Sasquatch is people leaving things out as a gift, you know, whether it be food or that sort of thing. But problem with that I see is that you can have other animals that might be involved. I think a lot, ravens actually. Crows. Yeah. They will move little rocks. I mean, I've people leave stuff out like colorful rocks and marbles and they'll get moved around by these uh ravens and that sort of thing. And, and there are stories of people that live on rural properties that have had allegedly interactions with Sasquatch, uh, whether they be friendly or not. I've heard both sides of the story. There's a whole element of people that say they can telepathically communicate yeah. with Sasquatch. I mean, I, I don't delve into that a whole lot. I don't know. I've never experienced anything like that. I've seen a lot of the people who have, have gotten into that. It gets a little bit kind of cultish in some ways. And there's a lot of weird stuff that kind of comes with that. Um, and I think some people that maybe go down the rabbit hole, because I think with this topic, um, people get Bigfoot on the brain or they get so invested in it that maybe maybe they had a sighting at one point and then they're so frustrated with their lack of finding anything else after that. I mean, there's researchers that went their whole lives without ever having an experience or a sighting. Uh, so maybe somebody had one sighting and then years later they're sitting here, you know, what am I doing? And suddenly they start communicating with Sasquatch and they take almost like a messiah complex. I'm not saying that's every case. I say with people, obviously it, it's a caution. You've got to, you've got to be careful with people because people will just make stuff up just because they want to be a part of something bigger. I mean, that happens all the time, right? Not beyond Sasquatch that happens with politics, with, with everything, you know, it's like just part of the human condition. But uh, to me, I mean, for example, in a case like this Alaska place, where it seems like there was initially sort of a aggressive thing, if, if there are Sasquatches there and that is what's going on. Since then, it's like maybe there's a little bit of an acceptance. There's still weird things that happen. Like some of the stuff we heard, we heard these mystery gunshots out there that would only happen when we would leave the cabin or be doing something a few times. And it's something they describe out there as going on almost like when there's activity, there'll be nothing going on. And then somebody steps out of the cabin, they hear a knock or a gunshot from the hill above them, kind of like a maybe somebody's keeping watch on them sort of thing. But at other places in North America, it makes sense. Let's say you live in an area for a number of years. Uh, an animal sees, you know, maybe you feed the deer or whatever, you feed your local wildlife. 
get a sense that maybe this person is not just out there blasting away with a gun and just being totally aggressive and destructive and trashing their their home if they live in a rural area. So maybe there's less of a hesitation to interact. I mean, I don't know. It makes sense if these things are just a flesh and blood kind of thing. Maybe there's there's a curiosity. It's interesting. I don't know. There's a lot of sort of there's a lot of unknowns, but there are a lot of things as as I mentioned in terms of speculating. I mean, we can we base it on previous behavior. If you're trying to predict what a certain animal is doing, you're going to base it on certain behaviors that you know are are documented because we don't really have that documentation, I guess. We're kind of basing it off of largely anecdotal and, you know, kind of experiences that other folks have had or stuff that we maybe have had ourselves, but it comes back to that interpretation thing. Alexander Petikoff. You are a badass, man. You're all the ways to find you located down in the show notes. Uh, anytime you want to come back, we will have a conversation or 3,000 about this. This is fascinating, dude. All of your work is incredible. I'm grateful for the time that you provided us here today, dude. Uh, we're going to cap it on here, but man, all the ways to find you located down in the show notes. You all know how this works, dude. Cannot thank you enough. This is mind blowing. I'm grateful yeah, for thank the Thank you for having me on. Have. Glad to share the Bigfoot uh, stuff with folks. So. Uh, people, I mean, there's, you know, Bigfoot is really popular now. It's, it's grown more and more. And I think, uh, it's good because a lot of people are coming forward with encounters from years ago where they might've been ridiculed for even sharing it. So a big part of it too, for me is just being able to share these stories. And I've had so many people reach out to me and say, I never used to take it seriously, or you know, I used to get made fun of for my encounter. I had to wait till I was retired to share the story. Cause I didn't want to be the Bigfoot guy at work. Uh, so people have real experiences. I mean, they're not all seeing shadows or making stuff up in their minds. So uh, I think it's important to get those stories out there and let people share them. And we can use that data then and uh, continue trying to find this great mystery. We could not agree more, man. It's fascinating. It's incredible. We support your work and anything you're doing, dude. Thanks again. This is unbelievable. Thank you for having me. Just want to take a moment and thank Alexander for coming by and hanging out with us. Make sure that you guys check out Bigfoot Beyond the Trail, his YouTube series, all the ways to find him located down in the show notes. Thank you again, Alexander. You will be invited back, dude. That was awesome. Now, while you guys are down there, check out our affiliate links. And then right there with our affiliate links is the link that reads expandingrealitypodcast.com. That's where links to all the socials go. That's also where you can sign up to become an expansive insider. And that's where all the dopest exclusive content is. It's a lot of fun and going off. So you guys make sure to take advantage of that. But for now, guys, go out into this incredibly beautiful place, whatever the hell this thing is, and y'all pick up a piece of litter, of course. Be nice to everybody that you come across. If you really want to step your game up, go ahead and buy somebody in line around you a coffee or a meal, something like that. As you traverse this beautiful land of ours, go ahead and get out of the left-hand lane because that's a huge pain in the ass you got somebody behind you wanting to pass. And above all and anything else, guys, go out into this incredibly mysterious place, whatever the hell this thing is, and y'all just be good to one another. Thank you so much for watching, for listening, for engaging, and just being the coolest son of bitches ever. I'll see you next time. The knowledge of sacred ancient tools of enlightenment survived the sands of time awaiting discovery for those of us in the modern world willing to seek them out. Among them are the mystical mudras, a Sanskrit word meaning seal, mark, or gesture, predominantly found in Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism. Mudras are like yoga for the hands. The poses performed with focus and intent offer the practitioner greater spiritual awareness and personal freedom. Take a deep breath in and relax. The Surya Mudra is the best called upon if you find yourself in the Mudra for some serious enlightenment. With two in the sacral and one in the root shoot, the Surya Mudra is perfect for deep cleansing your power portals. Align your shockers. One with all and available now. Expanding Spaniality.